Good evening, everybody. I'm Eleanor Gibson, acting US editor at Design, the online architecture and design magazine. Welcome to this talk tonight called Shifting Hospitality. We're at WeWork on 7th Avenue in New York City, and I'm joined by an amazing panel, which includes Radical Innovation Award founder, John Hardy, WeWork's James Woods, architect Danny Forster, and Yvette Young, who is the founder of Craft House Consulting. Tonight, we're gonna to be talking about hospitality and travel design to coincide with the announcement of shifting hospitality, sorry, the announcement of the Radical Innovation Award finalists. I'm gonna let the panelists introduce themselves and then we're gonna enter the discussion. Perhaps, John, you could start. Uh, hi, I'm John Hardy from the John Hardy Group and we are a development and development services company operating primarily from the Caribbean to Hawaii. Uh, we do major resort projects. I'll show you a few examples here. Uh, this is a uh, hotel, Four Seasons Lanai in Hawaii. We represent large capital sources and execute on the development side, redevelopment projects, ground up projects, programs, uh, various types of complex assignments that are all pretty much hospitality or timeshare. Uh, it typically is in urban areas, resort areas, and then the select service programs are all over the country. These are just some examples of uh, type of properties we do. This is actually in, in Napa and Yountville. Very cool project. It's the Palace here in New York, so it just gets an idea of some variety. Uh, this is a hotel we're developing in Atlanta that's um, a boutique with lots of food and beverage. Destination restaurant, rooftop bar, event lawn, beer gardens, that sort of thing. And we're looking at modular on this right now. And Danny's uh, helping us with trying to determine how we would do that. And then uh, let me introduce James Woods. Hi, Jim Woods uh, with WeWork, but here in my capacity as a radical innovations and hospitality juror for the last 13 years with uh, my friend John here. Uh, over the last 13 years, John uh, has put together a global competition for uh, emerging talent in hospitality, and uh, particularly in pulling uh, great ideas and concepts from outside the hospitality business. And I've been lucky enough to participate in that. And over the last 13 years, we've seen a lot of concepts that, uh, you know, while few have turned into uh, literal reality, uh, many of the aspects of the, the submissions we've seen have morphed into other concepts, including you know, distributed hotel concepts, using technology uh, in innovative ways, green concepts, um, pod concepts, as, as I like to call them, where uh, hospitality units are distributed across cities and, and areas. And you know, I think that a lot of what John and uh, our jury have tried to do is encourage uh, creative thought from outside the hospitality industry because uh, you know, frequently in the hotel business and in the hospitality business, we uh, are rewarded for doing the same thing over and over again by our capital sources, by our investors. And you know, I've had the privilege in my career of being involved with a number of innovative things you know, early on in the select service days, then in my uh, career with Starwood in rolling out W and then rolling out Aloft and an Element, and now with WeWork, uh, where you know, we're really focused on the member experience and delivering the best product um, for our members. So, Danny? <laughs> Uh, sure. Uh, my name is Danny Forster. I'm the uh, founder and principal of Danny Forster and Architecture, and we're an architecture firm here in New York City, and we focus not exclusively on hospitality, but do a, a good deal of it. Part of it in my background is that uh, in addition to being an architect, I was the host and producer of a show on Discovery Channel called Build It Bigger for many years, and made a number of documentaries about the rebuilding of Ground Zero and a lot of films in China. And just the the aspect of trying to tell a story about a building and essentially making a building, which is inherently pretty fussy and complicated and frankly not that interesting to a lot of people, finding ways to make that available and interesting has been uh, a, a critical piece in a, a lot of the work that we do in hospitality, which is fundamentally beyond the engineering and the architecture and the technology. It's about telling stories, right? It's about thematizing a building and allowing people to move through an experience and connect to it. 
Uh, and so we've loved doing that. We've done a whole host of different hospitality projects, including uh, recently on behalf of Marriott, we were the group that was asked to redesign uh, the Aloft Hotel brand, so the new generation of Aloft after the acquisition of Starwood uh, was our design in, in collaboration with Marriott International. Uh, on the kind of pure design side, we're, we're very proud uh, to also be the architects of a project called 8426th Avenue, which is a Marriott AC product here in Manhattan on 6th Avenue and 29th Street. And what you're looking at is a, uh, those are our two of our prototypes, but this will be the, the world's tallest modular hotel. And for those who are not aware, that may, basically means we're building the majority of the building off-site in a factory, in this case in Krakow, Poland. So the podium of the building, the base of the building is made of concrete in New York. And then all of the guest rooms, the tower, is then built off-site uh, uh, brought to America and then stacked up. And the, the, the compelling part, what's really interesting for the hospitality industry, uh, is that everything inside of the guest room is done in the factory. So the bed, the art, the TV, I mean, ostensibly everything sans the soap being in the dish is put into that room and the door is locked. And the reason that's so interesting is that when they arrive on site, the first person to open the door to that hotel room will be either the, the maid who makes the bed before the first guest or really the folks who turn the TV on. And that's really exciting because when you build a hotel, uh, while you do want to do the same room over and over again, the speed at which you can build that hotel and the quality and the consistency of that hotel room is often a challenge. Um, it's a really challenging building. It's a very t tricky thing to pull off. Uh, we've been working on this for, for going on three years right now. The building is under construction, as I said. And uh, ideally, in a few months, this, that's what you'll be seeing. Uh, the light will likely not be on in the room as we lift it. But beyond that, that is, that is, a, that is an accurate representation of, of that which will take place. Um, and maybe just in closing, we are super passionate about modular because I think it's, it's a big opportunity for architects to play a deeper role in the design and construction process beyond just figuring out what the thing looks like. Uh, but we also are, are doing a whole host of traditional buildings as well. This is a, a Marriott Autograph, so a boutique hotel that's uh, about to break ground as part of the Hudson Yards development here in Manhattan. And, uh, and that's what that guy will look like. That's uh, the amenity space looking westbound. And that's a, a lonely man by himself in the amenity <laughs> space. Um, but yeah, so we're doing a lot of different hospitality spaces. In fact, and we're doing some work with WeWork as well. And so, uh, yeah, looking forward to, to talking more about it. All right. Hey, guys. I'm Yvette from Craft House. Um, I started Craft House about eight years ago. And the purpose was really to marry what looks good, works well, and makes money. Um, we actually get a lot of really radical and innovative concepts that cross our desk, and it's really our job to help developers in the hospitality space make sure that what they're doing is sensible for the market, is sensible in terms of design, it actually works well, and it's not just for the cover of a magazine when it comes out, but that it actually operates well and will be there for a very, very long time. Um, the, am I going? And here are some of the projects that we work with. This is the um, Brickyard and Schoolhouse in Beijing. Um, Jim Spear climbed the Great Wall, and instead of coming down with a shirt that said, I climbed the Great Wall, he came back with a lease on an old farmhouse that wasn't being used at all. And um, he decided to renovate this farmhouse, and then all of his friends in Beijing were like, hey, we want a farmhouse. And after a while, the village was like, hey, it's great that you're renovating all these farmhouses. Can you now create jobs for us? So they created a schoolhouse. They took the schoolhouse, which was being used as a dump yard, basically, because all the kids were living in Beijing. And they made it into a hotel. Then they bought the brickyard factory, the brick factory, and then made that into a hotel as well. So it's a little bit of a destination outside Beijing. Um, this is the conduit in London. Um, it's a private members club in Mayfair, and what it is is really a private club that's not about exclusivity, and that's we do a lot of work with private clubs. It's about thoughtful inclusivity um, and creating a community for people who are in the philanthropy um, space to get together. Uh, you could work there, you could dine there, you can entertain, but it's really about people who are, want to make a change in the world. Um, similarly, this is the Battery in San Francisco. Um, this is a project that's in Bentonville, Arkansas. This is done by Rope Swing Group, um, one of our clients, and they are really working to create a destination in Northwest Arkansas uh, with a lot of hospitality for the people who go there to work, the people who live there, by bringing concepts that are often found in big cities um, to really the middle of Arkansas, which where you don't typically have it. So this is a um, this is a food and beverage concept where there's shuffleboard in the middle. It's very much a young concept for people to kind of get together and gather and have fun. Um, our projects are kind of all over the place. This is uh, Bamboo Inda on the left. 
um, and Green Village on the right. This, these are two projects built in Bali. Um, the project on the right, it's all bamboo, um, six-story houses that are phenomenally gorgeous and ethereal and open air, open space, and you can go and spend um, a week or a month or whatever, however long you want, um, just really being part of nature and enjoying that. Um, Bamboo Inda is um, one of our clients as well, and they are, it's kind of an experiment. Um, they are constantly evolving, changing, and under construction. If you were a guest there, uh, you'd probably be fairly frustrated by the amount of construction that's going on, because they're always like, tear this down, let's build that. Um, it's like innovation in in practice, um, but these are some of the projects that we work on. Uh, the most recent project that opened is the Time Out Market in Dumbo that opened on Friday. Great, thank you. So we're here to coincide with the announcement of the finalists for the Radical Innovation Award. So John, maybe you could tell us a bit about why you started the award and your vision to shift hospitality. Uh, I just think it's needed, you, you look at the industry today, it's, it's getting more schizophrenic than it ever has been. We have brands scaling up to be monster companies. We have a major separation between operators and owners. We have uh, a lot of lenders that are focused on, you know, limited service select serve properties that are not interested in anything other than, you know, something fitting in a certain box. So it's very difficult to innovate in hospitality, even more difficult now than I think it's ever been. So I think there, there was a need 13 years ago, and we thought of this, and there's probably even a greater need now to provide people with a forum who have new ideas, who have the, the energy and the passion to put them forward and to take the risk to be criticized or rejected. And uh, not everybody wants to go through that, but the, the true innovators will go through all that because they believe in what they're doing. So I think Radical serves a purpose globally to provide that forum for people that wouldn't have it otherwise. And perhaps you could tell us some of the finalists from this year and what were the standouts for you? The, uh, there's three professional and one student. Uh, the student is from Russia, um, Kazan State University, though I'm sure you all are very well of Kazan State. Then we have... Uh, Good football team. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> they're, they're known for their football team. Uh, and then we have uh, SB Architects with a, uh, a very interesting train-based concept, and we have representative from SB here. They're a very talented firm in San Francisco, the Bay Area. Do a lot of very high-end resort and creative boutique work. Uh, Cooper Carey out of Atlanta has a very interesting concept on filling in infill spaces in urban areas. And then we have uh, Danny here who has a, uh, a very innovative and, and radical process for doing modular hotels that is not the norm and radical is the key word for what he's doing is it's very difficult what he's doing he's done a great job of it but that industry is a fledgling industry in the u.s right now and he's you know way out in front of a lot of people and actually my goal danny would be to have the guest in the room when you install it <laughs> <laughs> are you gonna volunteer <laughs> exactly so you know with this is october 16th uh, please attend the event we present to a group of about 200 people the jury is very well known. Jim's been on the jury for a long time. Our jurors are very loyal and have been there since day one for the most part. And then the audience will vote on the winner and we'll announce it and we'll have a lot of celebrations around it and we'll help promote them. Some of these concepts actually do get to the market uh, more, more all the time, which is interesting. So the goal is to actually change the industry for the better in, in a way that is not being done now, which is very radical. Great. And Danny, perhaps you can tell us why modular construction why modular construction? Well, um, there is no good reason to do it in, in principle. In other words, the, you, the building you're building ultimately is going to be the building you're going to build. So the, the look, the feel, the strategy, the style, the interior design, all of that has nothing to do with the methodology. At the end of the day, it's like saying to someone, uh, do you like your concrete building or do you like steel buildings better? Presumably, no one knows the difference. In other words, when you're inside a building, it's still a building nonetheless, right? So modular has nothing to do with the type of building you're building necessarily, but it's just a, it's a methodology. Um, I'm sliding. Sorry, these are we work stools are mobile. Um, the reason to do it, though, is to say to yourself, um, how can you improve the method by which we build our buildings? Can we build them faster? Can we build them less expensively? And can we build them better? Generally speaking, if you're going to renovate your bathroom, the general contractor will say, you know, it's schedule, it's budget, or it's quality. Pick two out of the three. The dream with modular is that you can actually have all three. The idea being that when you build a building, uh, so often you are constrained by things like the weather. 
So if you could take a very complicated thing that you're doing 300, 400 feet in the air in the rain, in the snow, but instead do it under controlled conditions, that's a good thing. Another thing to say to yourself and is, imagine you're going to design a, a car. Uh, imagine you're going to buy a car. And the first thing you do when you buy a car is you hire, uh, you interview car designers. You pick the car designer you think is best. You, the car designer then shows you a bunch of images of cars you like and then comes up with a car concept. You pick the car concept and then you try and source the parts to build the car. That's a ridiculous notion, right? You would never go about that and yet that's how we build most architecture, right? Which isn't to say that you shouldn't have custom designed architecture, but there's a real opportunity to bring a lot of the systems and the efficiencies and the technology that exists in manufacturing and bring that to architecture. And if we can potentially bring down the cost of our buildings, we can actually invest more money in other aspects of the project. So for me personally as an architect, the reason why I'm so interested in bringing it forth in the work that we're doing is it's really depressing to design a great building that doesn't get built. It's really frustrating to see your work get value engineered off of a project. And modular architecture has enabled us thus far to deepen our involvement in the process and actually protect the integrity of the design. I think also there's a continuing shortage of uh, construction labor. So if you can consolidate that in a factory environment where it's safer and cleaner, there's a higher quality product that comes out of it, and it's also more sustainable if you're interested in sustainability, it's much less waste because they're, they're being able to mod, you know, standardize things. So it's an assembly line, basically, in a factory. So there's, there's a, I think there's a lot of advantages to it. It's just the industry of modular construction is not fully developed yet. It's just beginning. Yeah. And with this project that's been one of the finalists, is it's for a city, it's for a dense environment. How do you propose that modular construction can be seen in other environments? Well, ironically, it already exists in less dense environments, and in, in, in it's doing quite well. In fact, wood frame modular exists in America and has for many, many years. We've, we have a, a real history in doing mobile homes, frankly, right? And so stacking low four-story buildings made of wood, which is really the maximum height you can do, we're doing it right now in America and we're doing a fine job. Our experience in building volumetric steel high-rise urban infill is a little bit less significant. There, Europe is a, quite a bit in front of us. So I think actually the opportunity is to do it in urban environments where the cost of labor is extremely high, where the cost of land is extremely high, where the ability to have space is very low. I mean, think about it for a minute. Think about the amount of space you have to put construction materials. If you can reduce that footprint, if you can reduce the number of human beings you have on site, you can increase the speed and increase the safety of the project. So um, we're actually, we're focused in the technology that we're developing is specifically focused at trying to develop the high-rise urban modular solution. And Again, how do you propose that we keep it innovative? If, if it's modular construction, how do you prevent everything being the same? It's a great question. I mean, people often say, like, why as an architect, when your sole value proposition is your creativity, why on earth would you invest your time in basically making yourself obsolete? Um, the good news is that's not the case. Uh, modular is, is, is nothing more than a method by which you build a steel object and how you stack it up. What you put inside of it and how you clad it and how you shape it is up to the architect and to the client. So we do not feel limited. We're simply, I mean, gravity is a limitation. We still have to deal with it, right? I don't think modular takes away the architect's role. Um, I would say, though, that the work of the architect and the engineer uh, do get sidelined when all of our great ideas can't be executed. And so a big piece of what we're trying to do with our efforts on this project that's been selected for the radical innovation is to try and use some technology and bring it into the design process to increase the, the, our ability to execute. So using uh, VR technology and using some 360 camera technology to limit the challenges that come from when you're building, in our case, Krakow, Poland, where it's pretty difficult to visit the site and see how they're doing when it's so far away. Great, thank you. And James, you've been on the on the judging panel for the duration of the awards. I was wondering if you could tell us some of the themes that you've seen and what's been the biggest change over that time. Sure thing. Um, I think if you look over the last 13 years, you can bucket the submissions in a, in a few different in uh, tranches. We've seen a lot of uh, interest in green. Uh, certainly that's a trend we're seeing across society and a lot of the designs we see are either incorporating innovative green technologies in the development or proposing ways to operate the hotels in a more uh, environmentally sensible way. So that's one trend we've seen a lot of. We've seen a lot of incorporation of technology, which is something that I think hospitality historically has lagged behind uh, other 
uh, retail concepts and other consumer concepts. Uh, whether it's the use of technology in the guest rooms, technology in checking people in, technology in the booking process. We've seen, you know, John mentioned a little earlier, we saw Airbnb's kind of conceptual idea of, of people renting rooms distributed across uh, a large city years before it actually became a reality. Um, unfortunately, the people who who proposed it, didn't have the resources or the ability to make it happen, but uh, those type of uses of technology we've seen a lot of. We've seen a lot of modular projects. We've seen a lot of people suggest that the right way to build hospitality, which in its very essence is often the same thing repeated very many times over in a very similar way, that the right way to execute on that is in a factory built condition. So we've seen a lot of things that uh, have suggested uh, various ways of, of delivering things in modular. And then another thing that we've seen a lot of, which I think we'll, we will start to see uh, more and more real world examples of, are distributed hospitality concepts. This, this idea of deconstructing hotels, taking a hotel and spreading it out over, whether it's across a national park or um, in a, a beautiful landscape or even across a city, uh, and tying those units together through um, not just branding, but through technology and service, uh, where you can take an experience and distribute it across a, uh, an environment and not have a singular building. So I think, you know, if, you, if I look across the last 13 years, most of what we've seen has kind of fallen in those categories. John, I don't know if I, if I missed anything. No, I think that's very accurate. Uh, this is what I like about, one of the things I like about radicals, we spot trends long before they, they get out to the consumer. And it, it helps us understand what's going on in, in, in our business, what we can do differently or better. So, you know, it's, it's, a, it's trend forecasting in, in, in its most basic sense. And then, you know, we see these things later. We, 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 you know, one of our goals was to capture some of these ideas ourselves, which we never seem to find time to do, but other people are, are doing it. So it's, it's all good. And then the people that we meet are, are just amazing. So it, it's a very interesting process. Yeah, I think one of the things that underlines a lot of what we've seen is experience. And I think we tend to draw uh, submissions from a younger group of people, whether on the professional side or on the student side. And I do think that uh, you know, not just the consumers, but the people who are designing these are, are looking to create better experiences for their guests. And I think that's a really important trend and something we're seeing across, you know, again, across retail and, and consumer markets. So it's not just... Uh, it's a hotel room where you sleep for the night, but there's more to it. So it's in an interesting place. Or we've seen a number of concepts that are essentially mobile hotel rooms, whether it's on a train, whether it's um, a uh, drone, whether it's um, you know, an autonomous car, where the, the journey is part of the experience as well. Where, you know, traveling between LA and San Francisco, uh, instead of taking a plane and staying in a hotel, your hotel room actually moves with you during that journey. That was a submission we saw last year. So I think experience kind of underlines a lot of what we've seen. And I'd say a lot of the winners are, and the best submissions are not people from the hotel industry, which was one of our theories in the beginning. It's unusual this year. We have very experienced hotel architects, that are major firms that are finalists, but that's not the norm. It's usually someone who's not from the industry at all or not from the U.S. that has a great idea. The autonomous hotel suite that won last year, that gentleman is consulting with a car company in Korea and in Germany. So he's he's gotten into a whole other um, business venture with his original design. Great, thank you both. And Yvette, you're behind some recent private members clubs. How do you go about designing those kind of spaces, making a communal living area, giving people the enough privacy that they need? Um, I'd say each project is very different and unique um, in terms of what they're trying to provide the members. Um, you know, co-work space has their needs and even, um, you know, in the genre of co-working, there are a lot of different variations and derivatives of that. In terms of um, membership clubs, uh, it's about the brand and it depends on really what they're trying to do. So if it's about programming, then they've got to have a good amount of programming space. If it's about food and beverage, then it's got to be more food and beverage. So it's got to be right for whatever that project is, really. Um, but more and more, we're looking at, really, I mean, in this world where we're so over-programmed and we have so much going on, um, these micro-communities of, of um, these micro-communities developing spaces. So 
they can kind of get away from the noise that's around them and be in a space that allows them to be more productive and conducive to what they need to do. And have you ever found that something just didn't work in one of your projects? In terms of creating, suiting to communal? Yeah, you know, I would say that with a lot of these projects because they're so, um, people's wants and needs change frequently. So I think with private clubs, you have to realize that you have to constantly reinvent yourself as well. So spaces need to be flexible in how they're designed um, so that you can change them as the programming needs to change. Um, a great example is Soho House in New York where I started um, my career in private clubs back in 2003. And they've gone through so many iterations um, because people's needs have changed. When you went back in 2003, you wouldn't have seen a sea of you know, um, MacBooks, uh, it was very different than it is now. So, you know, they are also realizing that they need to start creating spaces that are dedicated to working um, to really accommodate the changing needs of members. Great. And you've also worked on a number of renovations. I was wondering, how do you balance historic and contemporary? How do you go about that? Um, it's really, when you work with something that's an older building, it's about creating the story and having that tie into the whole brand, the brand and the experience. So you really want to retain as much of it as you can, but within, within a framework of what's feasible and what makes sense. Um, there are often a lot of challenges. Many people think it's cheaper to do a renovation within a historical building. When you knock down one wall and you discover that there's like this, you know, gift of, you know, 10 months or 12 months of delay because you now have to fix something that you didn't know existed. Um, so sometimes the designs have to, you know, have to change as you discover these things and go through the construction of them. Great, thank you. James, picking up on something you said earlier about how there was a theme of green and environmental design, I mean, one of the issues facing hospitality in hotels is the amount of waste often. How, what kind of ideas have really stood out to you that could combat that? Yeah, as I said, I think that you know, green is now accepted as, a, as the norm. I think 13 years ago when we started, a hotel that was environmentally uh, friendly was, was somewhat novel. And now I think consumers expect from their hospitality experiences that, they, that the uh, operators use best practices. I think we've seen uh, anything from rainwater collection to gray water treatment to even just um, using materials that are um, generated in, in a closer radius to where the project is so you're not transporting things long distances, using materials that um, are reflective when they should be reflective or absorptive when they should be absorptive. Um, and just, I, I think people are thinking about the decisions they make during the design process much more than they were, uh, you know, even 10 years ago. I also think that as the industry has become more institutional, um, there has been a greater focus on profitability and a greater focus on cost of ownership. And I think that's driven a recognition that doing the right thing from an environmental standpoint often has long-term benefits um, that help you know, everywhere from the, the financing of the project to the long-term cost of operating the project. So you know, I, I do think that hospitality has been relatively slow in adopting this, but I think it has an opportunity to be a leader in the real estate industry, again, because it does this, often the same thing time and time again. And you know, my experience with Modular is it takes a lot of investment in, in, in uh, getting it right the first time. And I think that hospitality has this, has this opportunity to invest in process, invest in design, and scale it. And whether it's in, in uh, factory built conditions or in green technologies, the hospitality industry has an ability to be a leader there um, in a way that many other real estate asset classes don't because they don't have that repetition. Yeah, I think the, the one issue with that is that the more commodified hotels get, the less ownership exists in a long-term capacity because people are buying and selling these things like stocks. What that means is the argument to make about a fantastic sustainable technology that will lower the energy cost over X number of years is interesting, but 
Not necessarily if I'm gonna sell the hotel in two years, right? Because first cost becomes so important. So we find it super challenging when developers are oftentimes really, really interested in how to bring the budget down. But if there's a first cost associated with a sustainable technology that they're not gonna to get to enjoy, it gets pulled out of the project. So I, I think it's challenging because when, I hate to say it, but most of my clients see our hotels as vertical cash registers. I'd love for them to think of them a little bit more deeply, but that, that's not always the case. I think the, um the next generation of travelers is gonna really change this landscape. Once hotels start saying they're doing anything green or sustainable, they're gonna be very, um, I mean, they're very discerning, they're going to be on top of it, and they want a lot of transparency. Um, and so I think it's going to, I mean, it's gonna take a long time before owners realize that there is an investment that's, that has a return there, but I think the next generation is gonna really want to see some of that in the hotels and the places they choose. I think there'll be an evolution from the investor base and recognize it. You know, I spend a lot of my time um, in my WeWork capacity dealing with investors in office buildings. And in the office, in, in the commercial office industry, there's a number of investors who only want to buy buildings that are LEED certified. There's a number of investors who've realized the cost savings in net zero buildings and using innovative technologies. And I think over time, I, I do agree that it is a trading business hospitality, but I think the technologies and the improvements to construction and running these hotels long term will translate to bottom line. Those hotels will generate greater profit. They will sell for more money, and it'll be a, you know, a virtuous cycle. I think we're in the early stages of that. We, we do a lot of projects, and there's only one client we have that has done anything significant with sustainability, and we've done a lot on one, at one project. In our own project, we're, we're, we're trying to really bake in a practical sustainability exercise from the ownership side, the design side, the construction side, procurement side, and the operating side. And uh, our consultant, uh, Eric Riccardi from Greenview in Singapore, when he wrote his preliminary report, he said it was really innovative that the owner asked the entire team to participate in this, which I was kind of shocked that that would be innovative, which tells you how far behind the industry is in a lot of ways. But there are, there are a lot of things you can do that aren't that difficult, but you have to have people that care about it. And unfortunately, in our consumer society, there's not a high priority to it across the board. And as, as hotels become, a, become more commoditized, there's not a financial incentive for investors to do it. But we also have another client that's very smart the way they do it that other investors need to think about where if they are thinking they're selling a hotel in a year and they have some energy initiatives they can take that will cost $500,000 but it'll bring a million dollars to the bottom line, they do that, they raise their NOI and they get a higher cap rate and they can sell their hotel for more money. So that's like a win-win where you, it's a smart thing from an energy point of view but it's also a smart thing from a real estate point of view. So I think just a lot of this industry, because it's so fragmented, we have owners, we have brands, we have operators, designers, there's no consensus on how to go about doing this. There's people that are trying, and we're trying, other people are trying, but it's a growing you know, issue, it's a growing concern, and, and it's just gonna take a while for people to figure out how to, how to do this effectively, but I think it'll happen. Great, thank you. And there's also been, in recent years, a kind of push towards the wellness industry and the inclusion of biophilic design. Is that something that you've noticed in terms of projects entered into the awards or, in general, in terms of the hotel industry? Yeah, I think that's definitely, that kind of falls into the experiential and, you know, like green went from novel to expected. Increasingly, um, wellness elements are being just expected by the consumer today. They want to know that the you know that the materials that are used in the construction aren't going to make them sick, and that the air quality is good, and that there are areas in the hotel where they can uh, relax and recharge. Um, so you know, I think wellness. 20 years ago in the hotel industry meant you had a really large 20,000 square foot spa with you know a dozen treatment rooms. And wellness to this generation of consumer means something different. It means, um, it means a place that makes them feel healthy. It means a place that uh, supports their desire to lead healthier lives, whether it's through uh, mindfulness or uh, working out or, or whatever it is, but it's moving away from the big hotel gym and the big treatment rooms into um, kind of the same trend you're seeing in the fitness industry, which is more class-based things, more activity-based things, more 
uh, instructor-led versus individual activities in the wellness space. Yeah, I'll give you a simple example. We, we were at a, a conference in Austin a few weeks ago f with the hotel uh, group, and we had a really nice meeting room, and it was an entire wall of glass, and you looked out at Austin and, and green trees. And we were there in this room from 8 o'clock in the morning until 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And when the meeting was over, we're all like, oh, we're really not that tired. This is, <laughs> what's wrong with us? We don't feel like totally depressed and wiped out from eight hours here. And we realize it's, it's the natural light. And, and even in this room, just something as simple as that. And I know you've all sat in meeting rooms for eight hours with no windows. And they're usually, you know, really not that attractive. And everybody's stuck there. And it's really kind of gruesome after a while. And I think just something as simple as that is, is better for people. And that, that kind of thinking needs to be carried through throughout the entire project. I think with uh, wellness, there's also this, and I'm going to go back to it, of us being over-programmed and the average person is on their cell phone for five hours a day and the average like kid is on the phone for like two plus hours a day. And um, we don't we don't get enough time to actually connect with other people and connect with ourselves. You know, sleep is probably, you know, everybody's luxury right now. Um, so it's beyond kind of the space of physical wellness, but really kind of being able to create those experiences where you can relax, recharge, regenerate, disconnect. Um, and I think we're going to see some more of that as well. I would just, to play the foil a little bit, I do think that there is, uh, we're still in the kind of superficial branding stage of wellness. I think you know, light colored bamboo floors and linen sheets is a, is a wellness themed hotel at this point. That doesn't necessarily mean it's a rigorous investigation to like biophilic design, for example. That's a huge step beyond just having uh, no VOCs in your paint and having like green juice in the lobby. So I, I still think that it's, it, it's to me, it still feels quite, there's only a few properties that I know of that are doing it in a legitimate way where there's like research backed and it's quite thoughtful and it isn't aesthetic or superficial or branded. We, we had a winner in uh, Radical three years ago. It was the architect from Shanghai, and it was called the Green Hotel. And he had studied uh, the pollution in, in uh, Shanghai. And he, no, actually he was in Beijing, I'm sorry. And he had learned, you know, it's obviously very polluted. And he had figured out that the pollution level inside the buildings is worse than outside because the HVAC systems keep drawing in outside air and pumping it into the building. So the concentration of pollutants in the building is worse than outside, and outside is horrible. So he actually went to the research with NASA and determined the types of plants that you had to have within the building that would purify the air and how much you had to have, and his whole design was based on that. And he was, his theory was that there were a lot of old, older hotels in China that you could do this with, and he, he was based in Shanghai, but the hotel was in, that's coming back to me now, he was in Beijing, and he actually had a client that was gonna do it. I don't know if it ever happened, but there, there's an, a great example of somebody thinking through a different way to approach the design that would be better for everybody. Danny, you mentioned some interesting technologies that you're using, such as VR. What else is exciting at the moment and can be influence, influential in hospitality, do you think? Yeah, I think we're, as a practice, we're pretty interested in new technologies that we can actually work with tomorrow. And so I would say, you know, modular as a technology versus, say, 3D printing a building is also a technology. I think the time horizon and those two things are different. You know, the reality of us having a 3D printed building that's functional and a, and a lender will actually put down a $100 million loan on is not going to happen tomorrow. I hope, you know, something in the near future. Uh, modular is available today. The technology exists. The problem is the mechanics of the industry are a mess, and it's really difficult to take an industry that's worked one way for 100, 200 years and ask them to flip it on their heads. So from a technology standpoint, what we're trying to do is think of ways to look at pain points that exist in the process and apply technology to it in a way that would ameliorate some of those problems. So for us, we've experienced in a modular building, you have to build the prototype. You have to build that first room very early in the process. Uh, in the world of kind of architectural design, at the end of schematic design, the beginning of design development, you have to build your hotel room. That's like basically three months into a job, you have to finish the room, which is very, very early. So given that like intense level of acceleration, we tried to find ways to say, well, how can we remove errors that are going to take place given if you go fast, you will make mistakes. That happens, right? If you move at a fast pace, it's challenging. So how can we minimize issues? So in that case, we've, we've, we've partnered with a technology company to look at using VR and to take that, 
that spec book, that book that we use to do all the shopping that specifies all the materials and blend them together. So the, the people in the factory building this device are, are actually using VR to fly around the room, but every single thing they're looking at has the information they can use to purchase and assemble it. So it's not just a way to look at it in a cool way, the way we think of VR as a visualization tool. It's actually a translational tool to help people build a building faster with fewer mistakes. So that, that's an example for us of, I would call it kind of a micro innovation. It's using an existing technology, but it's applying it to an existing system, modular design, in a way to try and fix it so that when we go to the lenders, when we go to the developers, the people who ultimately have to write those $100 million checks, we can say to them that we've tried to reduce the risk in the process. Because I think the best ideas, you know, amazing concepts, if they ultimately don't get agreed upon by an industry, they stay as a beautiful concept that John sees in the radical innovation, but it didn't actually come to fruition. And do you have ideas of other exciting technologies that might be coming out? For example, there's a lot of interest in autonomous vehicles at the moment. That's going to really change how we travel. Sure. And I oftentimes will tell our developers when we are developing a property, for example, not to worry so much about the parking garage uh, because... He may not need it soon, and therefore, you know, we have many developers, for example, who are pulling their hair out worrying about the parking requirements and making a lesser building because they're worried about accommodating the car. I mean, it's only like recently people accept that Uber, in fact, has taken over, and therefore, like, the rental car market has an issue. Uh, I think the same goes with autonomous cars. Yeah, there, you, I've, in our project, we talked to valet parking companies, and they have said that the, the parking requirements are way less than they used to be because of uh, Uber and Lyft. And actually, there are zoning um, codes now in more progressive cities where they're actually limiting the amount of parking you can have. Rather than saying you have to have so much, they're saying you can only have this amount, and they're suppressing the amount of parking that theoretically you would need to, to reduce the amount of traffic in the, in the area. So it, that's a whole new trend that all based on uh, some of these new uh, technologies. And the actually, automated vehicles are much further ahead uh, than our society is in terms of accepting it. So the laws are going to be different. The insurance requirements are different. But you know, the, the actual technology of doing it is, is, is probably, you know, capable of being done for the most part now, but society's not ready for it. So it's going to take some time for that to happen. Great. And we're coming nearly to the end of the talk, but just to wrap up, we've seen some major disruptors to the industry. Airbnb, hotels are stripping back on services. Is there any if you could all tell me kind of what, where do you see it in the next 10 years? What, what will we see? Well, I think it's a really interesting time right now in the industry because you have, like I mentioned before, these big brands scaling up to be monster companies with 30 brands or whatever it is. They're, they're almost like an online travel agency themselves now. And they're going to put these brands everywhere because it drives stock price. And then you have, and that's, that's sort of the traditional indus industry, then there's a tremendous amount of select service development, which is you know, very uh, reduced in scale and its offerings. And then you have the, the sharing economy, which is Airbnb and Sonder. And they're really seen as tech companies, which you know, is kind of strange in a way. And you have Marriott going into home sharing, and then you have uh, you know, Airbnb going, buying an OTA, and they're going into hotels to be an online reservation system for boutique hotels. So it's all becoming very commingled. I don't know where all this is going. You have American Express involved. It's, it's very complicated. It's very moving very fast. There's a lot of big players involved. And you know, it's, hard, it's hard to imagine where it's going to go right now because it's so complicated. But it is definitely changing very rapidly. I think if I had to guess the, the one thing that will drive hospitality in this coming decade, say, I think it's going to be um, community in real life. I think technology has largely put um, a distance between people. I see in you know, young people who I deal with a, um, a reluctance to communicate face to face, a desire to connect with other people, but not really uh, understanding how to. Um, technology has become a real crutch. So I think that as real estate professionals and hospitality professionals, it's our job to create environments that are conducive to um, communities, using them to people, using them to uh, connect in the real world. And you know, for those of us who have a hand in developing technologies, it's using those technologies 
in a, in a thoughtful way to bring people together um, more and more in real life. So I think we'll see a lot more of that in, in hospitality. Well, if I didn't say modular, that'd be, that'd be dumb. So I, I, think, I think over time, I think there will be a significant shift in the architecture and construction industry to move into a more high-tech manufacturing mentality. But I would say to draft away from that a little bit, I think from, from a designer and architect's point of view, because our clients, those who visit hotels, are just more sophisticated, like we've gone through many iterations of the iPhone in the last five years, like we're aware of tech and design nuances. That means that there's more heat on the hotels to actually be better. They usually just have to be clean, right? Uh, I think what's great about it now, too, is also from a programming standpoint, the public spaces have to do more than just serve coffee. Like, how you think about what takes place in a public space of a hotel is a much more interesting conversation, more challenging, more compelling. Uh, and certainly when you're dealing with, say, a Marriott who's got 30 different brands, understanding what those swim lanes are and understanding what it means to be in these different spaces in a meaningful design way makes the job of the design and the architecture firms it's much more much more exciting frankly so i think uh hospitality as a space to work in is a i mean for me i designed the first hotel we designed was a building at ground zero it's because we had the opportunity to make a tower at ground zero i didn't care that it was a hotel i was excited about the site and the challenge of the nuance of building there uh having now done quite a few hotels over the last 10 years um, I, I find this space really interesting and increasingly more challenging. Um, and I think we kind of all agree innovation in hospitality is very slow. Um, but you know, as we talk about this, I'm like, I would love to put on a pair of VR glasses right now and have a heat lamp and, you know, some, you know, safari going on around me. And I think, you know, maybe that might be my submission for next year for the <laughs> award. Um, but, you know, a pod where you go into and you can kind of escape. It's a mini staycation and it's sustainable in a lot of different ways. Who knows? Um, but I do agree with you, Jim, that really um, people are very disconnected and finding ways to connect them in real life is very important. Great. Thank you all. Now we're going to open up for some questions, if anyone has any. Please raise your hand. Oh, yes, uh, this is about modular, I guess, so for Danny. Um, you know, in terms of what's, what's the most in interesting breakthrough for being able to stack all those boxes on top of each other? And is that, is that something that's been a big part of making it possible? Like, I'm just, that's the only thing that came to mind when I watched it. It's just like, is there a structure that has to be laid out to make them stand? Or is it something about the intrinsic design of each of those cubes that let them stack? And can you talk on that? Sure. Um, the, the opportunity with volumetric steel modular is that there isn't a secondary structure. So we're not building a concrete building and sliding in hotel rooms like filing cabinets. Each element is a six-sided volumetric steel object that takes its own weight and the weight of its compatriots above it. So the building is literally stacked as you stack the modules. And that's the, from, from an efficiency standpoint, that's where the speed comes during construction. The erection time, as it were, happens quite quickly. There's no magic in how that's done. It's just a steel building that's built in chunks as opposed to built in pieces. So frankly, from an engineering standpoint, that's not really where the complexity lies. The complexity lies in trying to pull off a kind of orchestrated construction site over multiple continents or multiple states or cities. Uh, doing so where you're designing a thing that's being built somewhere else that's going to connect with something else built into a different place. Um, it's taking an industry that's used to designing a building in a certain way and being asked to design it in a different way. So frankly, the engineer, I don't want to God bless my structural engineers, but that's not really where the magic lies. It's more in thinking about how we transform the industry than necessarily how we stack a, a stack a box. It's very cool looking though when you stack boxes, don't get me wrong. <laughs> Any other questions? Um, for Danny, did a client ask you to look into modular or was it the other way around? Um, it, it was the other way around. We, we had spent, it's something I've been kind of passionate about for a while and during my, you know, on my TV show, Build It Bigger, we did a couple episodes about some modular and some sort of post-Katrina storm relief stuff. It's, it's made sense for a while because if you've ever renovated your bathroom, you're like, is this really the fastest way to do this, right? Construction just doesn't seem like it's the most efficient way to build a thing, right? So it's been in the back of our mind. Uh, we had just finished a tower at Hudson Yards, and it was a very tricky design, very complex building. And as we started the new building on 6th Avenue, just frankly, a desire to make a kind of a crisp, elegant, and simple building was our goal. And as we were looking at it kind of early in the design process, it seemed to us that based upon what we were drawing, 
it was the right candidate to attempt it. In other words, many, many buildings can be modular. Not all are the best candidates to do it. We felt like we had a good candidate, a project that was programmatically straightforward. So public space below, all made of concrete. Hotels above, all made of steel. We had a floor plan that was symmetrical. We had guest room types that were fairly regular. So we said to ourselves, if we're going to do it, the time is right. The cost of construction is extremely high. Uh, we had a partner in Marriott who was open to the idea. We had a really, really open-minded developer. And so the stars kind of aligned, and, we, and we, we, we put the idea forward. I have a question for Yvette. Uh, you mentioned previously that you often get presented with some crazy ideas and you have to decide which ones you'll go with and which ones not. I wonder, could you tell me about that process? How do you decide? Uh, <laughs> that's a hard one. Um, a lot of people, um, they come up with crazy ideas and you know, through enough conversation, uh, we understand really where they are in the process and really how serious they are about it. Um, we also then take it from an operational and financial lens and see you know, whether or not this thing can actually be operated, if it's actually right for the market and if it will make money. Um, so it's not just about building something that's beautiful and gorgeous um, and really crazy and kooky, um, but you know, will this actually have a place in the hospitality market? And so you know, we challenge those assumptions a lot of the times and we're very happy to not take on clients and tell them, you know what, we're not really sure about this one. Great, thank you. Any other questions? Question at the front. Um, this is for anybody. Um, there are some retail spaces that sort of overlap into the hospitality um, industry. Like there's this place in Hudson Yards called Eden where you can sort of rent for a half hour to take a shower or take a rest. What's the future of um, the re overlapping of retail and hospitality in places like that? Well, Go ahead. I would just say that when you're, I hate that this is the conversation that I have many of the times with, with clients, but it's what are the different sources of revenue to make the project function? And thinking about the public space, not just as the place to check in, but rather a multiplicity of other kind of spatial opportunities and frankly revenue generating opportunities is how does retail play a role in that? So on the one side, it's just interesting to think about the programming of the public space and how you have to think of it. Frankly, the funny thing is that when we design and build a lot of our hotels now, the two or hundred guests that are staying there are, are part of the conversation, but it's actually like the hundreds of other people we're trying to think about for the hotel is whom we're designing the building for, which is really strange, uh, but interesting. And bringing retail into that public space and thinking about that partnership, thinking about that branded relationship and what it means to have a kind of a mutually accelerating relationship between the brand of the hotel and the brand of the retail is a conversation that is, is part and parcel of every developer we talk to now. I think retail only applies to the more sophisticated projects. If it's a Hampton Inn, there's probably not a lot of retail, but retail can be an advantage if you can, if you can make it uh, hyper-localized, where if you're in New York, you're in Chelsea, or you're in Upper East Side or Upper West Side, if you're in Chicago, and you have a, a partnership with retail that makes a, it more interesting for the guest and also creates a revenue stream, and it's, and it's something part of the local community that you've partnered with people that can provide whatever the form of retail it is, whether it's food or drink or products, it makes it more interesting for the guest, it's good for the community, and I think that's a really, that's a trend now that I see in a lot of places. Thank you. And another question for you all. What do you think is some of the biggest challenges that we're facing in terms of, you know, you've mentioned being more sustainable, but in terms of like, in, for the future of hospitality, what kind of the challenges do you think we're going to be facing? I think labor is going to be a big uh, factor. Uh, it's, it's the same with construction. There's, you know, there's a lot of uh, hourly jobs or you know, things that aren't that attractive for someone to pursue as a career. And a lot of, you hear a lot of discussion about the living wage and, and people that are against that or for it, but unless there's some means of providing opportunities for people to, to have a, 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 a decent living doing some of these jobs that maybe aren't the most attractive jobs in the world, uh, you know, it's, it's going to be a continuing problem. There's a big labor problem in the hotel industry. There's a big labor problem in the construction industry. We have all this controversy about immigration. You know, where are the, where is the labor going to come from if it doesn't come from immigration? And there's a lot of uh, resort hotels that rely on student, students in the summer to come over from another country and work. So it's, it's a big, I think that's a huge factor. Now, modular can help a lot of projects from a labor point of view for construction. 
that doesn't help you with the hotel operation. And you hear people saying that, you know, they're going to be cleaning rooms with robots. You know, that, that's a, we're a long way from that. And they're, in Japan, they had robots in the rooms. They had to take them out because people were snoring or talking in their sleep. The robot thought it was a direction. And the robot's banging around in the room <laughs> trying to do something. So we're a long way from that. But the nice thing about the hotel industry, if this can all be sorted out, it is a, a good career path for people. And you don't, you don't have to be a, a MIT PhD to progress in the hotel industry. You could, you could start as a, a busboy, and then you could become working in the restaurant. You could be a restaurant manager, and you become a general manager someday. So there's a lot of upward mobility in the hotel industry if it's managed pro properly, but you have to have enough people to, to operate it. So I think labor is a huge issue. Yeah, there are some arguments that, you know, there are some hotels that will encourage you not to have your room cleaned um, as a sustainability effort. Um, and then the flip side of that argument is, well, now you have housekeepers that are losing jobs because of it. So that's kind of where do you find the balance between technology and labor and what, you know, what is the way forward? It's kind of hard to uh, navigate that. Great, thank you. Any more questions? Nope. I think that's a good point for us to wrap up. Thank you for your time tonight, everyone. Thank you to my panelists. Thank you.